when God makes his residence in the center of our culture, uh, then transformation and change starts taking place in a, in a life-giving way. Now there's where, of course, persons involved in missionary work often get criticized. Uh, my friends will sometimes say to me, David, how is it that you are a missionary? Why would you be a missionary? Well, what's, what's wrong with that? You know, God, God called me for this, this vocation. Well, the problem is that you're changing cultures, you're changing societies. And isn't that pretty proud and presumptuous to think that you can go into a culture and change it? Uh, what, what, what ails you? Why, why would you do that? It's that whole relativism thing we talked about today, you know, that every culture has its own God and its own religions, and so we should, we should uh, permit every culture to have its own systems, and we would never, ever presume to say to them that they're wrong. Never do that. So you're, 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 changing, you're changing culture. And so I will sometimes respond by saying, well, uh, I think you need to bring the charges against God, you know, not against, not against me. Now truly, maybe sometimes, I, I'm sure sometimes I have been guilty of imposing my culture on people and so forth, and that's wrong. I need to repent of that. I need to repent of, th of that. But when God calls people to repent, and they repent, the culture is changed. There is transformation takes place. The gospel changes people and changes cultures. Um, for example, uh, in Tanzania, where I lived, um, there was a tribe called the Chaga, the Chaga tribe. the Chaga people. <clears throat> and um, back there in the middle of the 19th century, German missionaries came to work with the Chaga, and they said that they are not there, that, that they hope the culture will not change, that the Chaga will continue their culture uh, without any change at all. What they want to do is to introduce them to Jesus and the salvation that we have in Jesus, but not to change their culture. That was their commitment, these German missionaries. However, they translated the Gospel of Matthew, I think it was, one of the Gospels, the Matthew, I'm, I, I would think it was, translated the scripture into the Chaga language. And then they went to Germany to write a book about this approach to missions, doing missions, but no change take place in the culture at all. And um, in the meantime, the Chaga start to study this Jesus who is described in the Gospel of Matthew. And they began to say, look, Jesus has come to bring abundant life to our culture, to transform the things in our culture that are not good. And so they had a large meeting where they came together to look at things in their culture that need to be transformed. There's no missionaries there doing this, but they have access to the scriptures, to Jesus of the scriptures. And the first thing they said is that this practice of uh, men beating their wives has to stop. That's got to stop. And they went on. Uh, this practice of alcoholism. It was a very alcoholic culture. That must stop. And they went on and they con con continued these discussions and they said the practice of female circumcision, uh, female genital mutilation, that's got to stop. That can't continue. And they went on and they talked some more and they said, and polygamy, that's got to stop. Uh, husbands and wives, husbands should be monogamous, monogamous you know. Um, and then they went on and they discussed some more and they said, and having dirty houses, that should change. And so what they did was to work very specifically at areas in their culture that needed to be transformed in the light of Jesus coming and making his abode within the center of their culture. Now that happens over and over again when the gospel comes into a culture and people receive the gospel. It begins back in the book of Acts, back in the book of Acts, uh, when the church was going into uh, uh, Gentile areas, and many Gentile areas are becoming believers in Christ. And we read about this in Acts chapter 15. As these missionaries were going into, uh, into Gentile areas, they were finding difficulties because the Jews practice uh, male circumcision 
and the uh, Gentiles did not practice this. And so uh, the Jews were making a strong case that uh, the Old Testament describes circumcision as necessary for believers in God. So they had this big meeting in Acts chapter 15, it's described, where they look at the question. And the decision was made in that great conference that the church in its movement among the religions of the world is not going to become a movement that imposes changes on the culture. They won't do that. They won't do that. But it will be a movement <laughs> that will nevertheless transform cultures by bringing about new life. So they were very specific about the things that needed to be transformed in the, in the culture. Not circumcision, not dietary principles. They could continue to eat what they wanted to as Gentiles. They didn't have to follow Jewish dietary principles. But they could be free to follow their Gentile practices, but with certain changes. One of which was they had to desist from idolatry. Don't worship these gods that the uh, Gentiles worshipped everywhere. You must abandon the worship of these gods and stop offering sacrifices to the gods. These gods are not worthy of being honored as divinities deserving of sacrifice. You need to abandon idolatry and everything having to do with idolatry. So a transformation at that level. Sexual sins needed to be abandoned uh, in this new community that God is creating. Uh, th there has to be transformations, righteous living and chastity within this new community. And uh, so they sent this letter to the churches saying, you're free. <laughs> continue being Gentiles. Uh, you can continue eating pork if you want to. We're not going to impose our dietary principles upon you. You're free uh, in all those ways. But there's certain basic moral principles that are universal, which you do need to follow. One of which is idolatry it must be put away. It's a very, very remarkable decision. Very remarkable. And what this means is that the church in its mission invites people to come to the culture core with Christ at the center, but continuing to live within their culture. And uh, it was an amazing, a simply amazing uh, decision that they made. In Kenya, East Africa, there was two tribes that lived side by side, the Maasai and the Luo. The Luo were becoming Christian. The Maasai were traditional African religion. The Maasai had this notion that when someone had this notion that God had originally created the cows for the Maasai. In fact, the cows had come from heaven as God's gift to the Maasai. And so if a Luo family had cows, the Maasai believed that somewhere along the line, maybe a hundred years ago or whatever, someone had taken Maasai cows and given them to the Luo. Because all cows in the world, by implication, belong to the Maasai because God had created cows for the Maasai, which meant they made very bad neighbors. And so if the Maasai go and steal cows from a Luo homestead, they're not really stealing. They're just getting back what God originally gave to them. The consequence was constant conflict on the borders between the Maasai and the Luo, constant conflict. I remember my parents were living out in that area of Kenya and occasionally I would go out to visit them. And on a couple of occasions when I was with them, we would see fires in the far distance and know that there was another war going on that night between Maasai and Luo. It was not good. And so the Maasai elders got together with the Luo elders and all, and both elders, both the Maasai and Luo elders agreed that the way for this conflict to stop is for them to invite Jesus Christ into their community. That Jesus brings about peace. Jesus enables Messiah and Luo to worship together. Jesus brings about the church, a new community that transcends tribal boundaries. And so they sent a delegation, a Messiah and Luo delegation, to go to the, um, to go to the uh, uh, nearby uh, church centers 
and to a church center and to ask them to send someone to work among them, both among the Maasai and among the Luo, to bring about peace between these two communities as they would be introduced to Jesus. That was the request. I was part of that, of that whole discussion because I was living in Kenya at the time and part of that community. And uh, the decision was made to accept this invitation. And so Luo Christians now, who are church leaders, pastors, missionaries, they moved into this Maasai area and began to work with the Maasai, introducing them to Christ and to the church. And so you have, for the first time ever now, Maasai and Luo beginning to worship together. And indeed, just as they thought, the wars stopped. They stopped having these wars. It was amazing. Um, but then, because they're worshiping together now, Christ was bringing peace into this conflictual area. And then, problems began to develop, however, because of different cultures. The Luo had different practices particularly when you would have a, a congregational meal together. The Lua elders would go and they would sit in the house. The Maasai elders would sit with their people under the trees. Difference in culture. And so these differences in culture were becoming uh, quite troublesome. And so they decided to have a meeting like Acts 15 that I just referred to a bit ago and to discuss together this Acts 15 meeting, what they should change, what should be changed within their culture now that they're followers of Jesus, and what can remain the same. And so we had this meeting, uh, Maasai elders and Luo elders, and we sat in a circle. I was invited to participate with the African bishop presiding at this meeting. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. The first thing the Maasai did was to describe what Christ is doing among them. And the first thing the Luo did was to describe what Christ is doing among them. I nearly wept as they told stories of, of transformation, alcoholics putting away their alcohol, uh, families being established, um, just a variety of transformational uh, gifts of grace that were taking place in this community. Uh, noteworthy, laying aside their weapons of war, and the wars were stopped. Uh, the warriors had laid aside their weapons of war. They were abandoning these skirmishes anymore, working rather to build the peace between the different communities. It was really very remarkable. And then the bishop said, now let's take a look also at what needs to, uh, what, 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 what is in your culture which is very good, that Jesus really blesses. And the Messiah said, well, our hospitality, that's a very important thing. We are a very hospitable people. And uh, they said, uh, the way our women dress, we like the way our women dress. Uh, the Messiah women would wear many, many beads. And they said when they become Christians, they should actually put on more beads than they had before because they're daughters of the king of the universe. And the daughters of chiefs always dress up with a lot of beads. So get more beads on, 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 around your necks, you know. So uh, that was, I was just sitting there very, very interested. And they said, um, oh, our diet is wonderful. We just love our diet, uh, which I had a bit of a problem with. Because what they do, they milk the cow and then they, uh, in, 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 into a, 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 a wooden uh, little container, and then they go and pull a plug from the jugular vein of the cow and catch some blood, then plug it up again, mix that up, and they just believe it's like an ice cream cone. They just love that. So they're saying our diet is just simply wonderful. Well, remembering Acts 15, where they said, you can continue eating your, your, what you wish to eat. Although it does say in Acts 15, you should not drink blood. So I was squirming about that one somewhat, I would say, as I'm listening to them describe uh, what needs to, uh, what, what, what is blessed. Uh, respect for parents and hospitality and, and so forth and so forth. They uh, just talk with great animation about their wonderful culture, which they love so much. And so we're saying, so Christ affirms these themes in the culture. Yes, 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 they said. Then 
the bishop said, and what needs to change in your culture? And the first thing they said is this practice of a man needing to kill another man before he deserves to get married. Remember, it's a warrior culture. And so they're always in conflict with each other. And so in the traditional culture, a man needed to demonstrate that he is brave enough and strong enough to be able to get married by killing another man. And so then you go and you speak to the woman you want to marry and say, I'm so brave, I've killed two men. And she'll say, wonderful, you know, you are such a brave wife, love to marry. They say, that has to stop. That just has to stop. We must lay aside this warrior culture, absolutely. It's not the way of Christ. It must stop, absolutely. They all agreed to that. The other thing they said is alcoholism has to stop. And witchcraft and venerating the ancestral spirits those traditional religious practices need to be abandoned in the light of the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the presence of Christ among us. It does not fit with our, with our practices of worshiping ancestral spirits and the practice of witchcraft and that kind of thing. We must lay all of that aside. And um, then they said, polygamy must stop, having multiple wives. And we spent much of the day talking about that and what to do if you already have a couple wives and so forth, uh, how you find the way forward in that. And so that was a big topic that day, very respectful and profound discussion we had about all of that. Another one that was, uh, that was uh, quite a shocker was they said, a, a shocker to us from outside, not, not for them. Um, it was that they, they said, this practice of wife swapping must stop. In their culture, their traditional culture, uh, when uh, your buddy would stop by your house for an afternoon cup of tea, you would not only give him a cup of tea, but you would offer him any one of your wives that he wanted to have a rest with that afternoon. And so a teacup and a woman was the naturally expected hospitality for men walking across the grasslands of the Maasai. And they said, that must stop. And we said, uh, why must it stop? Well, they said, it is completely contrary to the spirit of Christ and to the Christian understanding of marriage. This practice must stop absolutely. And so it was a whole day of affirming things in the culture and of critiquing things in the culture, all in the light of Jesus now making his home in the midst of the culture, you see. What this means, and I'll conclude right here, is that the Christian movement is not a movement which proselytizes. It does not proselytize. Proselytize is calling someone from moving from one culture to another. Rather, it is a movement of conversion. A movement of conversion. See what happens here. When a person abandons the gods whom we have invented and says yes to Christ, that is conversion where Christ now becomes the center of the worldview, you see, and begins his transformational work within that center. That's conversion, staying within the culture, but with the new life of Christ working within the believers now, within that culture. A proselytizing movement is a movement in which you move into another culture from your own and begin to practice the practices of the other culture, and so you become a nomad who leaves your traditional culture to embrace a new culture, proselytization, you see. We said, no, that's not what's going to happen among the Maasai. We encourage you to stay within your culture, but as you embrace Christ, transform your culture in the light of the life and teachings of Christ. That's what we decided. It was an amazing meeting. I thoroughly enjoyed being there, and I was very impressed with what was happening as they were considering what it means to be followers of Christ, to leave uh, the practices in their culture that need to be critiqued, but embracing things in their culture which they felt the Spirit of Christ blessed and affirmed.